That is the collect prayer for today's Mass, the Septuagesima Mass. And it calls to mind a bit of that idea of that, uh, of that merciful deliverance. It calls to mind an additional celebration that we have outside of that of Septuagesima for this day, which is the flight of the Holy Family into Egypt is what we commemorate as well. That flight, that, that, that taking off of the, of the Holy Family and going to Egypt, we encounter it regularly every year, especially at Christmas time. We think about it during the Feast of the Holy Innocents most especially. But with that Feast of the Holy Innocents, we think about the slaughter of them by the wicked Herod, and we think about the, the, the narrow escape of, of, the, of the Holy Family and that inspiration that they, they follow. But the actual journey, the actual flight, more often than not, we kind of have a passing glance over. We, we, we think a little bit about it, but we don't really meditate upon it. But itself, that flight into Egypt, it has many things to, to take and to learn from that. Because it was a great trial, a great difficulty for them. What did we have at that time for that caused that fly? First off, it starts with who is ruling at that time. Herod is the, the king of Judea. He is not a Jew. He is a foreigner. He is a usurper to the crown. He does not have rightful possession of it. But there he sits and pretends to rule. And all follow him. And as such, as not being a faithful man, actually being a very wicked man, he's extremely jealous of his own power. He'll do anything at all to, to maintain that. And he's paranoid that at some point along the way, because he knows he doesn't have a rightful claim to that sea, and he knows that he doesn't be truly belong there, he's afraid constantly that somebody will come along and take that power from him, and put him off of his seat, or possibly even depose him of his own life. And so he governs with this constant paranoia. And then that faithful night, when the three wise men arrive, and herald to him the fact that they were following a star, and that they were trying to strive towards finding the, the, the point that, that it was pointing to, the birth of that king there, he knew he had heard of the prophecies of the birth of the Christ child, the Messiah, the King of the Jews. And now he was filled with that same dread all over again, that he would be deposed from power, lose his grip over the land of Judea. And so what does he do? He tells the wise men, go and report back to me what you find so I can come and adore him. He had no intention of adoration. He had no love of God in his heart whatsoever. He was truly wicked. But he wanted to do so because he wanted to remove that threat to his power. He wanted to do so so he could then send soldiers in and, and apprehend and slay that infant child that the wise men were seeking after. Well, we know how the story goes. They arrive, they present their gifts, they fall down and adore the Christ child. They recognize him to truly be the Son of God. And it's revealed to them by an angel that they should not go back the way they came. And so they leave to return home by a different route, avoiding Herod altogether. Well, as time goes on, Herod realizes they're not coming back. Yet this threat still persists to him. He sees this potential taking of his power. And so his heart hardened even more. He makes the drastic decision to send out the soldiers, not to find one child, but to slay all of the children in Judea. And we have that slaughter of the holy innocents. However, God is not conquered. God, his will, is always done. And so what happens? In the middle of the night, an angel comes and appears to St. Joseph and tells him that he needs to go. He needs to take Mary and the child, and they need to flee into the land of Egypt. Think about that for a moment. They don't know anybody in Egypt. Never been there before. 
They don't know where they're going to live when they get there. They don't know what types of trials they're going to face along the way. And yet, in the middle of the night, Joseph, at that prompting from the angel, right away, he gets up, he awakens Our Lady, and they pack up the infant Jesus and whatever meager possessions and provisions that they have, and they immediately set out upon that journey to Egypt. That journey is a long and arduous one. They know that going into the trip with what lay ahead of them, but they don't even hesitate in doing so. The distance from Bethlehem to Heliopolis, which is today known as Cairo, which is where they stayed when they arrived in Egypt, is over 400 miles distance that they had to traverse across a harsh terrain of a desert in order to arrive there. And in doing so, they didn't have any place along the way to really be counting on an ability to, to stay. They knew that most of it was desert, most of it was wilderness, and that they, they would have to sleep out in the elements. That it was winter time, and they knew that they would face real harsh cold at night. And during the day, the sun would warm up and it would be searingly hot, and it would be extremely dry. And they'd have to somehow trust in the providence of God that they would find more food along the way, that they would find more water along the way to be able to survive. They also had to realize that that journey was going to take them 40 days in order to arrive there in Egypt, with no knowledge of what they would find when they got there, with no knowledge of who or where they might stay with, with no idea of how long they were going to be there. They only knew they had this long journey, that they had this known destination, and that they were leaving a land of the chosen people of God to head into a pagan land of Egypt. Yet they went immediately because they trusted inherently in the providence of God and that they wanted to do God's will above all else. And so, as such, they went out, they stayed a time until eventually Herod died and the angel told them that it was safe to return back home again. That is the journey into Egypt. It's not merely a singular event, but a long struggle of time, and a long implementation of sacrifice, under the one point of just trusting that God's providence had a purpose for it all. So what do we learn from that journey? We learn many things the more we meditate upon it, the more we think about it. But here are a few things for you to take away from the journey into Egypt. First and foremost, the obedience to the will of God. The Holy Family, they obeyed immediately because that is what they had as the highest point to follow in their lives. No matter what came, It was always that looking to see what the will of God was for them in their lives. And because of that willingness to follow that will, they were able to keep the Christ child safe. They were able to save his life, and they were able to possess him longer. Now, we, likewise, have to be prompt and immediate in that following of God's will. And it manifests itself to us in many ways throughout our life. First and foremost, we see it in the, in the law that is ingrained on every man's heart. The Ten Commandments. Those are there for us. The moral law of God that he's laid down for each and every one of us to follow. And at times it's hard to do so. Our inclination is always towards sin. And moreover, that the outside world around us day by day gets more and more wicked. and makes it more and more laughable to be faithful to the to to the morality that god has given to us so to maintain and to persevere in that is hard at times it does require sacrifice from us but we know that so long as we continually look after following the laws laid down in those ten commandments we maintain that purity of our soul we don't sin we don't lose the possession of god 
in, in which we have in sanctifying grace. Secondarily, we find that obedience in the laws and the teachings that the church has laid down for us. All of those things that we have as teachings of the faith, we treasure every single one of them and, and guard it with our lives. Even the smallest of, of doctrines we hold as a great treasure for ourselves. And all of those laws that the church has given us, those things like fasting, those times of abstinence, those days of obligation, whatever things that are passed down to us, those two we tre treasure because each and every single one of them, even down to the smallest, contains what God's will for it is for us in our own lives. And so every time I don't eat meat on a Friday. I'm not just not sinning. I'm actually doing something proactive in following the will of God and following what his church has laid down for me. Every time I show up to Mass on a Sunday because I know that I'm supposed to be there or a holy day of obligation, I'm not only preventing myself from falling into sin, I am performing exactly what God's will is for me this day by being here, by coming. Thirdly, we have that obedience to lawful superiors. We find it in the spiritual side of things, that obedience to the clergy whom we've entrusted our souls to, the ones that we go to confession to, and we go to spiritual direction to, and we look to for helping us to save our souls. If we put that trust in them, then it's important that we obey them in the, in the advice that they give. That is part of that obedience. Wives have that same obedience due to their husbands. Children have that same obedience due to their parents. Employees have that duty of obedience to their employers. And as long as any, wherever the, that lawful authority manifests itself by a person in our lives, so long as they don't ask us to sin, we are always not only avoiding sin by being obedient, but practicing virtue by following the will of God in each and every instance. Fourthly, we find ourselves that opportunity of obedience to be contained in the divine inspirations that we get. We find them through prayer, and we confirm them through the aid of spiritual direction. Things that come to us most especially like the vocation that we are to follow in our life. Are we to be married? Are we to be priests? Are we to be religious? We only know that because God inspires our hearts, because we've prayed, and because that, that, uh, that those points that come to us through whatever means they arrive, via, you know, through that vessel of prayer, that we confirm those with that sound counsel that we're given and follow after it because we know it to be God's will. Any, any following of a vocation is going to have its difficulties, going to have its trials all our life long. But we know that when we find our vocation, that is God's will. And despite the trials, we follow that vocation. <laughs> or any other myriad of things that may come up as to what God is inspiring us to do in an instant, we prayerfully accept them and follow them, even if it means hardships down the line. Next, Something to draw from that journey is that placing of God's will above our own will. In that instant, we have that example of the Holy Family. Mary and Joseph, naturally speaking, they would have loved to have stayed dry. They would have loved to have stayed warm. They would have loved to have continued to, to, to rest in the, their cave in Bethlehem and to, 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 to bring up that that holy child through his infancy. However, that is not what God was calling them to. He was calling them to go out across the desert. But because despite their own natural inclinations, they immediately departed. They set out right away. And of course, what did they get for their reward of following God's will? They're, they receive hardships. It leads them to the desert. It leads them to Egypt. It leads them into the unknown. But ultimately, because our Lord's will is always the big picture, it leads them to safeguarding the Christ child. It leads them to that continued opportunity 
of adoration of the God-man. And ultimately, it leads them to eternal paradise when they leave this earth by their reward in heaven. In contrast, we see what happens when we put our own will above that of God. We see that in Herod. What did Herod do? He chose to follow his own will. There's a star in the heavens that is pointing on a spot in Bethlehem that has been foretold by the scriptures for a long-standing period of time. Men <coughs> from the east come and announce this to him. This great miracle is worth. And all he can think about is maintaining power, holding on to it as long as possible, his own greediness. And so he puts that will above everything else there. He could have gone. He could have adored our Lord. He could have been the, one of the first of the followers of Christ. But he didn't. He hardened his heart and he stuck to his own will. And by that, what was his immediate reward? Yes, he was rewarded with that maintenance of power for a short duration of time. He held on to that position for a, a little while. But it led ultimately to his own slaying of a myriad of children, the murder of innocents, and it led ultimately to his own horrifying death, a death that was that occurred with him being consumed from the inside, being eaten alive by worms and vermin while he decayed while still alive a sign of God's condemnation of him, a sign that he truly had sinned greatly, and he remained unrepentant throughout the entire thing. The pain was so great that he begged the people around him for a sword to, to, to end his own life. And during that time, there are people that had come in from the outside that he viewed as a threat to his throne, and even though he was dying and on his deathbed and could barely even move and was being consumed, begged his own son to go and slay them, lest they take that vestige of power from him in his last moments. That was Herod's end, and ultimately it led to the loss of his soul, because he chose his will above all else, rather than following the will of God. Lastly, as a point to take from the journey into Egypt, I want to point out the willing spirit of sacrifice, of our Lady and Saint Joseph. Forty days they spent going across the desert, journeying by foot and Our Lady upon the ass to that foreign land, that unknown wilderness that, that lay before them and those various amounts of suffering and difficulty that they knew that they would encounter but knew not in what degree or way. Forty days they traveled to Egypt. They remained there for a period of time. Forty days they had to travel back afterwards. That spirit of sacrifice is so important for each and every one of us to possess. If we sacrifice well, if we choose our sacrifices to be beneficial to us, then they bear fruit. Lent is coming. Our own forty days lays ahead of us. And this time of Septuagesim is when we do that preparation. We think ahead. We look to see where are my faults? What are my failings? Where can I improve? And what kind of sacrifice can I use during that time of Lent to be most beneficial to my own soul? And when I have chosen those things, I offer them generally, generously. I look to give as much as I can to our Lord and to be as generous as possible. And then, with that same spirit, I look to see in each and every one of those opportunities that arises in my day-to-day -day life, those unforeseen sacrifices that come and I cannot avoid them, and I have no choice but to suffer through them. Those things I offer up with that same generous spirit back to our Lord. And when we do this we'll find that the sacrifices help us to continually possess Christ by sanctifying grace in our souls. As the Holy Family possessed him during their lives and their care of him during his childhood. And those sacrifices will ultimately bring us to a great reward 
in the end, that paradise, that salvation of our souls, as it one day returned the Holy Family back to Judea safely, and ultimately led to their own receival of that heavenly reward that we hope to join them with. This is that season of Lent and its purpose. It's to strengthen our souls, to increase our grace, and to bring us closer to the eternal possession of God. These are the things that we learn from meditating upon the simple stories that come to us in the life of Christ. Stories like that flight into Egypt. That we look to that, that telling of how our Lord escaped his own in, death in, in his infancy in order to fulfill all of the prophecies that led to his ultimate opening the gates of heaven and the redemption of of mankind. And by learning from those things and, and, and applying it to our souls and trying to sacrifice well in imitation of that holy family, it's that very redemption that we will one day find for our efforts. May God bless you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen.